like I said, everyone's welcome to uh, interject at any time, just unmute yourself and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we are studying uh, after a week, uh, week's break, we're gonna, we're right back into the Kuzari and uh, we are continuing along our discussion of the, the specific name of the four letter ineffable name of God, the shame, what's known as the shame Havaya or the Tetragrammaton in English. Um, and it's something that is unique uh, to the Jewish faith. Other monotheistic faiths do have a name for God, Allah, Lord, um, Elohim, but the name, the Yudke Vavke name is unique to the Jewish experience because, and this is consistent with Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's whole idea of experiential Judaism is far superior to religion arrived at by intellect. And this is, hi, welcome, hi Aviva. Um, and this has been the, really the, 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 the central uh, th thematic idea that has run through the entire work of the Kuzari throughout really from beginning and through the very end. It is the thread that binds the entire Sefer together. The idea of uh, living God experientially instead of living God intellectually. Um, is what for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, what is the hallmark of Judaism. And as we've pointed out, different medievalists emphasize or de-emphasize this idea to varying degrees. But for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, this is the sine qua non of Judaism. Um, and he, he now launches into this idea, we're on page 394 in the Kuzari. Afterwards, you know, he goes through with the history of how this name has been passed down from generation to generation, starting with Adam HaRishon. And when Adam experienced God, he experienced God directly as a creator, and therefore was able to infer that God that created woman from the side of his body was also the creator of heaven and earth. And then came Cain and Abel, and we discussed Cain and Abel um, and their encounter with God prophetically, um, experientially. Um, as, as well in our last discussion. And in the middle of this subparagraph five on page 394, he says, next came Noah, then who also had this prophetic experience of God, then Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And so it continued until Moshe and the prophets who succeeded him. These individuals called him Yudke Vavke based on their respective prophecies. A prophet who has an experiential encounter with God is able to understand God by his four-letter name. The people who learned from them, okay, so then we have the next, let's, let's say, level of people who receive tradition from the prophets and believed in their prophecies, we can also include ourselves in that category, also called him Yudke Vavke because they knew that he attached himself to human beings through his words and actions, and that elite individuals attach themselves to him through prophecy. Yes. Yes, through prophecy. I mean, that's one of the ways to experience God. There really is no other way to experience uh, let, let me let me put it to you to you this way. First of all, it's a, it's an excellent question because it really helps bind things together in Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's Veltan Shang, his whole world view. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi views human experience as the as the ultimate way of a Jew connecting with God. To experience God, you must do through do so experientially through prophecy. That's to have a face-to-face -face encounter with God. That's the highest way of knowing God and attaching oneself to God. But the mitzvot also are a way of experiencing Judaism. You're not necessarily experiencing God in that moment because you're not having a face-to-face -face encounter, but the actual action that you do through living through a Yom Tov or a Shabbat or something like that is a higher order of living one's Torah life than through using 
purely intellect alone. And that's why he has so much in section three, where we talked about piety, we talked about saintliness, about how behavior really modifies the individual. For Rabbi Huda Levi, your behavior modifies you more than your, in, your intellect modifies you. How could anyone say that uh, having prophecy is not the highest level of experiencing the life? It seems obvious that if Hashem is talking to you, that's the ultimate. Okay, so again, a good follow up question. How could anyone suggest otherwise? No one's suggesting that prophecy is not the apex of divine experience, of experiencing God. The question, however, is, is there a dichotomy between experiential Judaism and intellectual Judaism, or are they one and the same? In other words, how would you define the prophetic experience? Is it a completely different um, experience from having the highest intellectual understanding of God? Or is prophecy simply a continuation of that intellectual exercise? That the more one um, perfects and hones their intellect, the closer and closer they become to the prophetic experience until you pass a certain threshold and you receive actual divine communication through your intellectual faculty. You, you, we've all had these eureka moments, right? Where these aha moments, where all of a sudden something will hit us. And the ancients believed that that was actually a form of divine communication, divine inspiration, where you work your mind long and hard enough that eventually you connect with something that's outside of yourself that helps you receive that idea. It's, a, it's like what we would call in Hebrew, like a mini Ruach HaKodesh kind of experience, where you don't even know where that idea came from, but it comes from somewhere beyond yourself. You know, can you relate to what I'm saying? You understand what the point I'm making? Pro no, 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 no. I'm not. I, I, I'm so as we'll, we'll we'll talk a little about the different levels of prophecy momentarily. The point that I'm making is that is prophecy an extension of the intellect, or is it something completely different? Is prophecy the the apex of a person who has worked upon themselves intellectually, and therefore they reach that next level of connecting with something beyond themselves? Or is intellect something completely internal, where I have a, a brain, it's independent of anything that is external to myself, and I can only perfect it to a certain level. And then when something communication comes to me from outside of myself, that's what we call prophecy. And it's a completely different um, exercise than the intellectual exercise. For Rabbi Huda Halevi, the intellect is self-contained and it is not something, even though he believes that there are those eureka moments where you can gain some kind of inspiration from without, but that's not at all the same thing as prophecy. Prophecy is implanted within the individual, not based upon how hard they work intellectually, but rather because of their piety and their righteousness, that a person is gifted with prophecy. So that prophetic experience is totally different from a perfected intellect. Maimonides believes that prophecy is the apex of our humanity also, and it's the ultimate connection with God. But he views it as part of a continuum of achieving perfection of the intellect. Just like you get a eureka moment that comes from without, the ultimate eureka moment is divine communication of the prophetic experience. So that's the dichotomy that I hope to be able to unfold for you more and more as we go along in this section. Okay? Yeah. Must exert effort, according to the Rambam, to make it to the level of prophecy, and without that effort, he cannot, he or she cannot reach that level. Correct. Correct. Right. Whereas the and by the way, that's that seems to be universally agreed upon. No one can achieve prophecy without effort. 
effort is required. The question is what kind of effort is required? Is it a, is it a pietistic effort or is it intellectual effort? All of that, no, Hashem is never given prophecy to like an imbecile or somebody who it right, with, with, with rare exception. You do have an, ins, an event called Vayikar Elohim El Bilam, that God happens upon Bilam. That's the term Vayikar, but that's not a normative prophetic experience. No, I didn't say that. I just said that there is the there is there can be an an, an extraordinary form of prophecy that did not require preparation. And that was the instance of Bilam, okay? Because he did not work on himself, whether you want to look at it intellectually or pietistically. Um, and nonetheless, the Torah says, and that's why the Torah uses that unique verb, Vayikar, that God came upon Bilam. Mm -hmm. uh, The Rambam dis does discuss that a person has to be in good spirits. A person has to be in a, st in a state of equanimity and um, not sure whether simcha is always required, but it has to be in a state of menucha sanefesh. You have to be at peace with oneself and you have to be in a good mood. Yeah. Linda, go ahead, please. Sorry, Linda. Sorry, yeah. sorry I just had to unmute. Um, how, so I might've missed something in the past lectures, but what, how are you defining prophecy? Are you defining prophecy as being able to like tell people what's going to happen in the future or how is that exactly defined? Excellent question. Um, how do you define prophecy? Prophecy, um, and I actually hope I'm going to give you a handout um, today uh, from, and I'll put it on the screen, from the Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, who had, in his Derech Hashem, The Way of God, which is a very important work, um, has a whole section in Derech Hashem on the prophetic experience. Um, and we've just taken a couple of snippets from it. Prophecy is divine communication, plain and simple. Normally, when I pray, I speak to God and I don't hear anything back, okay? Prophecy is where you actually hear communication back from God. You are getting some divine communication. That communication can be in the form of images, or it can be in the form of words or a combination of the two. That's what prophecy is. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will be made privy to future events, because that's a specific form of prophecy that God will give to someone who he wishes to be a messenger but the vast majority of prophets who lived in the biblical era were not dispatched by God to send a message to the people. And most people who achieved prophecy in the biblical era are not written up in the Bible, and they had private pro prophetic experiences because of their personal piety. There were many, many more prophets than just, you know, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. There were many, many more prophets, people who were very, very righteous in their personal lives, and through their perfection of self, achieved a prophetic experience. But the reason why they're not written up in Tanakh is because they did not have, their prophetic experience did not have any kind of national um, legacy importance. It was a personal prophecy for them. So that's what prophecy is. Did I answer your question, Linda? Um sort of but like so on a personal level can can we ordinary people ever like assuming we've never achieved the pinnacle of righteousness or intelligence could we ever experience any type of personal prophecy i mean there are times you know when sometimes people feel they just sort of feel the hand of god in things and i don't know if you would interpret that as prophecy or not but yeah, in prophecy your own doesn't life, exist you know? anymore. They're just things where you feel. Yeah, it's a good question. Prophecy does not exist. Does anymore. it? No. Prophecy has been, according to the Talmud, prophecy was um, seized to uh, divine communication seized at the very beginning of the Second Temple period. That's when prophecy seized, and and as a matter of fact, the entire project 
of the rabbinic community was to maintain the integrity of the Jewish religion in the absence of prophecy. Because when you no longer have the ability to ask God shilas, to ask God questions, you need to make sure that the rabbinic tradition is very, very strong because otherwise there's no way to, to send it up back to heaven and say, what did you mean by this God? Okay. And that's why you see a complete paradigm shift at the very beginning of the, of the second temple period because prophecy ceases and now the rabbinic community sort of takes over and says, we need to become more involved in the, in the transmission process of Torah from one generation to the next. Yes. So, uh -huh. How do you know there's no prophecy? One second, just, just one, one question here. Prophecy one always exists. Like I'm reading all these articles about what's going to happen in the hospital. And there are all these stories of people who came to him and they're saying the doctors told me I'm going to have this operation. Um, and he says, you'll be fine without the operation. And the person was fine. So, what is that? Is that, the, is that like a lesser form of prophecy? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's something called, I mean, you, it, it goes by different names. The Ramchal has an extensive discussion as levels of levels below prophecy, which he calls Ruach HaKodesh, divine inspiration. And there's divine inspiration with a capital D and a capital I. And then there's a borrowed term of Ruach HaKodesh. What we have today is we have very, very righteous and pious people who you can call it maybe have intuitions or have some kind of uh, intuitive ideas that may come from outside of themselves, but they're really not clear um, messages that are coming from God. But there, there are, are in, in, intuitions that very righteous people have about a certain situation. Just like you have empaths and seers that exist even today, even outside of the Jewish faith, that some of them, you know, once you put aside the 90 or 99% of, the, of the, the fakes and the charlatans, but there is a certain le percentage of people in the world today that have a certain kind of uh, sixth sense or intuition to be able to know what the right path is in certain situations. So I was really curious when you said that because I thought it would be because of Rakhonik and Yevsky's piety, but just some empath who has intuition and doesn't have piety, why would they know anything? The answer is because some people are born with it and some people acquire it. They're not mutually exclusive. You can have people who are born with certain intuitions and certain abilities that they acquired not through piety. And then you have other people who weren't born with it, but through, through developing themselves are able to develop this, this particular trait through a, through a very, very pietistic way of living their lives or through an intellectual um, you know, perfection. Okay, so... All right, so there's a lot to discuss, a lot to think, to, to think about. Um, the people who learned from them and believed in their prophecies also called him Yud Kevavki because they knew that he attached himself to human beings through his words and actions, and that elite individuals attached themselves to him through prophecies. Now, the next paragraph discusses levels of the prophetic experience which are not perfect but which are either prophetic or near prophetic experiences. And he therefore writes, these individuals returning to the people who themselves had prophetic experiences were able to envision God through intermediary divine representations called glory, uh, kavod, divine presence, shekhinah, kingship, malchut, fire, esh, anan, cloud, image, tselem, likeness, Tmuna, vision of the rainbow, Mar E Hakeshet from the book of Yecheskel, and others which proved to them that the communication with them emanated from God. The prophets called these intermediary images glory of Hashem, the Kavod Yudke Bavke, and sometimes just Yudke Bavke, even though they were really only intermediaries. 
What really I believe what Rabbi Yehuda Levi is making reference to over here is, so, is are different levels of either prophecy or near prophecy. And that's why I wanted to share with you this little snippet from the Ramchal today on different levels of prophecy. As I mentioned, um, section three of Derech Hashem is all about prophecy. And it's worth, it's a worthwhile study unto itself. Just a couple of snippets, one from three, three, five, and one from three, five, four. The experience of prophecy must come about through intermediaries. Man cannot attach himself directly to God's glory or perceive it as one sees a man standing in front of him. The perception of God involved in true prophecy must thereby, therefore come about through God's servants whose task it is to provide such a vision. And what he means by God's servants, it could be an, a, a, an angel, it could be even a non-sentient creation of God um, that God sends forth to the individual as a vision. These intermediaries then act as lenses through which one sees the glory. What a prophet actually perceives, however, is the glory itself and not something else. The way one sees it, however, depends on the particular intermediary involved, just as one, what one would see through a lens would depend on the particular type of lens. And how do you do, say the word lens in Aramaic, aspaklaria? That's the term aspaklaria. If you've ever heard that term before, it just means the form of lens that a person is using to which, with which to see God. There are therefore many degrees of perception depending on the lens involved. It may cause the subject to appear, to appear far away or very close. There, are, there can furthermore be various degrees of transparency or opaqueness in the lens itself. And later on, when he wants to talk about mosaic or the prophecy of Moshe, the prophetic vision is not like seeing something directly. Rather, it is like seeing it through a lens in Aspaklaria, or rather through a series of lenses where the image is refracted from one to the other. Although it is not seen directly, what is seen through the lenses is the object itself together with all its motions. And this is what Rabbi Yehuda Levi is alluding to when he talks about the different terms that are used for a description of a prophetic vision. The reason why there are different terms, the glory of the, um, um, the Anan, the cloud of, the cloud of uh, I saw a cloud. These are all descriptions of different kinds of lenses that the prophet, through which the prophets were able to perceive God. Besides this, the prophetic vision is not seen as if it were transmitted through a clear polished lens, but rather through a dull lens. It is thus impossible to see the glory clearly, even after the image has undergone all these refractions. Despite this, however, what the prophet sees is actually God's glory, and he is aware of this without any doubt whatsoever. In this respect, there are also many levels and degrees of prophecy. One prophet may see through a clearer lens than another and therefore perceive his vision with greater clarity. No matter what level of prophecy is involved, however, the prophet always perceives the true essence of each concept. He knows for certain that the one who is revealed and made known to him is the creator. Every prophet also comprehends the concept of the lens as well as its essence and mystery. He perceives and understands the information that is revealed both clearly and accurately as discussed earlier. Nevertheless, just as the glory is shown to him as a refracted image, so is the information granted to him transmitted by means of allegories and metaphors. It furthermore only comes through a dream, which is the vehicle of prophecy as discussed earlier. When a prophet has a prophecy, they are usually in a sleeping state, in a trance, where their body is not working and they appear to be unconscious. That's the normal state of prophecy, okay? The prophecy of Moshe, however, was on a totally different level. And he then goes on to explain how Moshe's quality and quantity of prophecy was totally different and was completely unique from all other prophetic experiences that are documented in the Tanakh, okay? So um, 
What Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is referring to here, and he continues in paragraph number seven, some even called the Ark Yudke Bavke, as when they said, arise Yudke Bavke when the Ark was lifted, and rest Yudke Bavke when it was set down. And likewise, God has ascended with the blast, Yudke Bavke with the sound of the shofar. In all these instances, they were really referring to the Ark of God and not God himself. So sometimes the uh, prophecy is through an image and the image contains um, the message that God wishes to communicate. And it may take some time for the prophet to unpack the image and to completely understand the message. Sometimes um, physical objects that are imbued with divinity can also be called yud ke vav ke, as he just explained in this paragraph. So this is what I wanted to share with you for, for, for today. And you know we're going to develop this idea of the prophetic experience as we go along. Um, and the, the sections that I'm actually uh, teaching now in Morin of Uchim, as we get further into the second section of Morin of Uchim, the Rambam is going to clarify his position on prophecy, very different from the way that I've expressed it according to Rebbe Yehuda Halevi. Why do you think it's important for us to discuss prophecy even though we don't have prophecy around us? Ah, why do we need to discuss prophecy? Prophecy is a cornerstone of our faith. Without the existence of prophecy, then the entire premise of our faith collapses. Because what is the prophetic experience? It's divine communication from God to man. If we don't believe in divine communication from God to man, then how do we know any of the mitzvot to be authentic, to be uh, the desire of God? Well, I understand, but I'm saying, why do you think it's important for us to go into the details of prophecy as opposed to just believing that Hashem gave the Torah to those who gave it to us? Um, you know, I, I suppose that there could be a number of answers to that question. Aviva, do you, would you like to suggest something? So you're a, Hale, you're a Halevian. You're, yeah. In other words, the experience of experiencing God um, and experiencing what what you what you feel in your soul, what you feel in your emotions and your being, um, are very much a part of um, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's emphasis in in Judaism. But here in particular. Rabbi Yehuda Levi wants to quantify this four-letter name of God. And he wants to make sure that we understand that we only utilize it as a borrowed term. You and I, when we use that, when we focus on that name of God, are relying upon generations of prophets who actually understood that name through their personal experience of God, through their devekut, through their attachment to God. We use it in a borrowed sense. Um, and uh, all we can do is hope for and strive for and pine for that kind of elevated experience. Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk to you today from the Kuzari. Let's go on to the Parsha. Parshat B'chu Kotai. Um, this Shabbos, we're going to finish Sefer Vayikra, the book of Leviticus. Um, the very last chapter, Chapter 27 of Sefer Vayikra seems to be somewhat out of place, or perhaps I would say it seems to be an addendum, because the very end of chapter 26 says, Eila ha'idot These are the statutes, the laws, 
These are the, the, the transmissions or the instructions and the, and the statutes and the laws that God gave to Moshe on Mount, Mount Sinai. And then you have this add-on chapter of chapter 27. There are some modern biblical scholars who believe that this was an add-on at some point later. That's not our tradition. Our tradition was that it was all composed together and given by God at Mount Sinai. But for some reason, this last chapter of Vayikra is an add-on and it really is a totally separate category. It deals with the laws of Erechin, um, which is um, when a person wishes to dedicate a certain amount uh, of their assets to the temple. They have a number of different ways in which they can do it. One of the ways that is discussed is Erechin, where a person says, I hereby pledge my value uh, uh, to the temple. I, per, I pledge my child's value or my wife or husband's value to the, to the temple. What you're doing essentially is creating a, a, a very close connection between yourself and the object of value that you wish to donate to the temple. So that's one way, that's one of the topics of chapter 27. I'd like to focus on two other topics of chapter 27, known as, the, the first one is called Timura, which is a very specific law in Judaism. There's a whole tractate in the Talmud called Tractate Timura. And it basically works like this. If you take a look at source number one, I hope everyone can see it. Erech is value. That's Erech. Erechin is values. Yeah. Okay. Or valuations, I, I should say. Okay. If you take a look at um, chapter 27, verses 9 and 10, the Torah says, V'im behema asher yakrivu mimeno karban l'ashem, kol asher yitain mimeno l'ashem yihiya kodesh. If a person has an animal that can be brought as a sacrifice, then by declaring it holy, it immediately is designated for sacrificial purposes. So if I have a goat in my backyard and I say, Kodesh Lashem, I designate that animal as holy for God, then that animal is, it is implicit that my intention is to bring that goat as an offering on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. Now this is talking about where, when you have a tabernacle or temple standing, that won't work today. If you say Kodesh Lashem today, then probably that means you'd have to donate the goat to tzedakah or something like that, or its value to tzedakah. So it doesn't really have the same um, halachic uh, assignments today. But then the Torah says in verse 10, lo yachli fenu, you're not allowed to switch the animal once you've designated it. Velo yamir oto tov bira o rabitov, nor may you exchange it either good for bad or even bad for good. In other words, if I, have, if I took my goat, um, Tom the goat, and I realized that Tom the goat is an old goat and I have a young, more, more robust young goat that I'd rather use for my sacrifice, I'm not allowed to say I'm exchanging Tom for Bill, okay? Even if Bill is a better goat, okay? Um, you can't do that, the Torah says. And if you try to do that, says the Torah, then what you've done is you've actually, if you say, I want to exchange Tom and instead bring Bill as a korban, then the halacha is that both Tom and Bill are sanctified and you have to bring both of them to the temple as a gift offering. So that's the law. That's the law. And Tractate Tumura is basically an elaboration on the laws of how this works, of how if I designate Tom as my first goat, and then I designate Bill as Tom's exchange, both Tom and Bill have to be brought to the temple. And the exchange basically doesn't work, even though I meant, I only meant for Bill to be a sacrificial goat if I could use it instead of Tom. Nonetheless, you have to bring both. Okay. He wasn't able to go back on his word. That's right. Yiftach wasn't able to take back the declaration of holiness. 
Correct. Not really. No, not really. It's a spe the Yiftach's situation was a special case, right? It doesn't really, you know, really, um, halach, there's a whole, the halachists discuss whether Yiftach really had to make good on that now or not. Okay. We have another law, which has to do with pidyon, with redemption. If a person, whenever a person declares something to be holy, um, even if it's not a, even if it's a non-sacrificial animal, let's say I take a bar of gold and I declare it to be holy, okay? Then it belongs to the temple. What if I want that bar of gold back? What if it has, or let's say even better, I take a pair of candlesticks in my house, silver candlesticks, and I declare them to be holy for God. And then my wife says to me, that was my grandma. Those were my grandmother's candlesticks. How could you do that? So I have to go back to the gizbar, to the treasurer of the temple, and I have to tell him, I need to buy the candlesticks back. So there is a very special law in the Torah in just a few verses after the law of Tamura, which says as follows. If a person sanctifies his home to God, whatever valuation is placed by the treasure of the temple, that shall be its valuation, and that's what he owes to the temple. If, however, the person declaring it holy wishes to redeem it and get his house back or his candlesticks back, the asaf chamishit kesef erkecha alav v'hayalo. He has to add one fifth. The halachists debate whether that one fifth is twenty percent or twenty five percent because there's two different ways of calculating what a fifth is. But the bottom line is is that you have to pay above and beyond. So if the candlesticks are worth hundred dollars, in order to get them back, you have to pay either one hundred and twenty or one hundred and twenty five dollars to the to the temple. Yeah, it's like a pawn shop. Yeah. But okay, now the question is why is that? Why does the Torah require you to add? Why does Torah require? Okay. You yeah. Yeah, well, it, you have to keep your word. You made a pledge. But, but yes, there are consequences. And maybe that's the thing is that if you pledge those candlesticks for the temple, there are consequences to your word. That's an excellent point. The Rambam, uncharacteristically, even though in his Yad HaChazaka, which is a codification of law, normally does not insert commentary to the reasons behind the mitzvot, at the end of the laws of Korbanot, he has the laws of Timura. And he discusses both of these principles, both of the law of Tumura, which was the first set of verses that we saw, and the law of Pidyon, which is the second uh, law that we just studied together. And we'll read it in English just for the sake of time. He says, even though all the laws of the Torah are arbitrary decrees, which means that we, don't, we, necessarily, we can't necessarily fully understand their reasons, as we explained at the end of the laws of Mi'ilah, or desecration, or you know, using an, a sacrificial animal for non-sacrificial purposes, it is worthwhile to meditate on them and assign reasons to whatever part of it you can assign a reason to. Behold, the early sages said, Shlomo understood the reasons of most of the Torah's laws. So if Shlomo was able to gain insight into the majority of the laws of the Torah, then we should try to do whatever we can to try to gain insight, even to mitzvot, whose reasons really are not so apparent. In light of this, it appears to me that this which the Torah says, and both it and its replacement shall be holy, which is the law of Tumura, is similar to the subject where it says, and if the one who sanctifies redeems his house and adds a fifth of your appraisal to it, they're really very much related. The Torah descends to the end of a person's train of thought and some of his evil inclination, for a person's nature urges him 
to increase his possessions and conserve his money. Um, and even therefore, if he pledged and sanctified, he may retract and regret it and redeem it for less than its worth. So basically, God is essentially telling us, I understand human nature. You're going to have remorse, perhaps, after you pledge something to the temple, and you may wish to skimp and perhaps pull back a little bit on your initial pledge or your initial gift. That's essentially what the Rambam has set up until now. Therefore, if he redeems it privately, the Torah makes him add a fifth. Similarly, if he sanctified an animal with corporeal sanctity, he may re what he means to say with corporeal, with inherent sanctity, which means it's meant to be a korban, a sacrifice, he may regret it. And since he cannot redeem it, he may come to exchange it for one that is worth less. And if he were given permission to exchange the worse animal for a better one, he might also exchange the better one for a worse one and just call it better and just say that it's better when it's really not. Okay? Therefore, scripture closed the way in front of him so that he could not exchange um, uh, the, the animal and find him if he did exchange by saying that both it and its replacement will be holy. And all of these things are to subdue the will and refine the character. Most of the laws of the Torah are nothing but advice from the master of, of advice to refine the character and to straighten the actions. Not, we don't mean advice in saying that it's optional. We mean that God is really counseling us on how to become better people. And so the Rambam's opinion is that the reason for this mitzvah of tumurah is to, is to make sure that we don't fall short of our original commitments. I'm worried, says Hashem, you'll make a commitment. And then when it comes to making delivery, to coming to make good on it, you may want to sort of cut corners. So I'm not giving you that opportunity to do so. And I'm helping, I'm helping refine you as a, as a human being so that you'll know that once you make a commitment, like Aviva said, you fulfill that commitment 100% without skimping, without cutting corners. Okay, yes. Yes. It applies to everything. Here, give, give us an example. Give us an example. Right? You commit 100%. With relationships, with, with pledges, your word is your bond. Yeah, yeah. How often are children um, dis disillusioned by adults who make promises to them and don't follow through, right? So this is training the individual. When you make a pledge to God, make sure you carry through with it. And there are certain, um, uh, certain protective laws that ensure that you will make good on what you originally pledged. And that's what the that's what these two laws share in common. Yes. Um, the first passage that you quoted in number one um, reminds me of what we say on Erev Yom Kippur when we say, So now I see where they took the language from. Yeah, Tamura means exchange. Right. Yeah. But I'm saying it's using these words, yeah. Tamura, so they must have taken it from this idea. Precisely. Because you're using the money to give to Tzedakah instead of giving yourself. That's right. And the other thing is, um, whoever translated this Rambam, I mean, seems strange to me for him to say, even though all the laws of the Torah are arbitrary decrees, it doesn't sound to me like he's saying they're arbitrary decrees. Yeah, he doesn't. I, I think you're right. I think that's a poor choice of word, verbiage. Right. I just pulled this out of Safaria. But I would say Gezerot are divine decrees without without known reasons. Right, is what he, reasons doesn't mean there aren't. Reasons. You're 100% right. You're 100% right. We um, we have we are charged with trying our best to finding reasons for the mitzvot, even the ones that are chukim, the ones that are 
statutes that don't have an apparent reason. Yeah, I, I agree with you, arbitrary is a poor, poor choice. Um, I ran across this um, tshuva from Rav Yashiv of blessed memory, who was a great rabbi of the, uh, of the late 20th century. Um, and he writes, he writes as follows in this, uh, he first quotes the, this Rambam that we read above. And then he states, Yesh harbei mikrim sha'adam nimne lidvar mitzvah. There are many instances in life where a person is called upon to perform a mitzvah. Hu nichtav b'sefer hazikaron li'irei Hashem u'lucho shavei shamo. And such a person comes to the ready and is prepared to uh, give away his time and his resources um, and he's counted among those who are uh, among those who fear God and consider his name. But after a while, you start to have remorse. Because it's only natural for human nature to sometimes kick in and turn a person away. And that's really the whole function of this set of laws in the Torah of Timura, to not allow your human nature to kick in, to not in any way short the, the law, the, the, the temple, what it's due, and to in any way profane what you had already declared to be holy. And then he quotes from a medrash. The medrash tells us, that Agripas Hamelech Bikesh Lahakrif Biomechad Elef Olot, yet King Agripas, who was a Greek king in the times of the Second Temple, wanted, he made a pledge and he said that he would bring on one day 1,000 burnt offerings to the Jews' temple. Shalach be Omar le Kohen Gadol, and he sent the message to the high priest Al Yakriv Adam Hayom Chutz Mimeni, um, and I, I'm giving this on the condition that no one else be allowed to bring their personal sacrifices on this day. Like in other words, choose Wednesday. Wednesday, I'm bringing a thousand bulls or a thousand goats, whatever he was sending, but on the condition that no one else be allowed to bring uh, their any private sacrifices on that day, like block off the altar just for my stuff. 100%. Non-Jews can bring korbanot, yeah. So ba'ani echadu v'yadoshtei torim. So on that very same day, this poor man comes with two little pigeons that he wants to bring as a sacrifice. Amar la kohen elu. And he says to the kohen, please take my pigeons and bring them on the altar. Amar lo hamelech, sivani, li al yakriv adam chutzmi meni hayom. And the kohen said, I'm sorry, but the king has already given an order that I can't bring any other sacrifices today except for his. Amar lo adoni kohen gadol, arba'a yonim anitzah b'chol yom. So this poor man says, please, Mr. Kohen Gadol, Mr. High Priest, I trap four birds every day. That's what I do, that's, that's, my, that's my job. Va'ani makriv shnayim umit parnes mishnayim. And every day I take two of the birds, I bring them to the temple. He must have lived in Yerushalayim. And the other two, I bring home for, for my wife and myself. And if you don't accept my birds, you're actually taking away my parnasa because I believe that the whole reason why I'm given the opportunity to catch four birds every day is because I dedicate two of them to the temple on a daily basis. If you refuse this gift, who knows, God may take away my four birds tomorrow. So Natlan Vikrivan. So the Kohen Gadol saw this man's sincerity, took his birds and brought them as a korban. Near Elo La Agripas Bachalom, Karban Shel Oni Kodomcha. And Agripas the king had a dream. I guess they stopped Agripas' gift because they couldn't keep the pledge. And uh, basically he was shown in a dream that this poor man's two pigeons. Um, superseded your 1,000 burnt offerings. He says, Omnam yesh ka'ila hachayim be'emuna kezu. And that's, Rav Yashiv is creating an exercise in contrasts. He's saying there are some people who will make a pledge and based on human nature, they will fall short. 
and really just not follow through. But he says, but there are other people who live with such vivid faith in their lives. They truly believe with every fiber of their being that it is this gift that I'm giving to the temple that is the key to my sustenance, is the very key to my, to my, to my source of life. So let's, like Aviva said, put it into perspective for other things. I spend, let's say, an hour a day studying Torah. That's my time that I take off from my work, my, my other activities, my family life. I have to set aside one hour a day or two hours a day, whatever that time is, that I sanctify for my, for my Torah study is the example that he gives. Or for a particular mitzvah. I go every week and I set aside Tuesday mornings to learn the Parsha or whatever, whatever time. So he says, not only do they not regret that time that I've dedicated to the holy, right? But they also view it, and such people who live with true faith realize that it's not only that I'm giving up something by studying that Torah or doing the mitzvah for those two hours a week or a day or whatever it is, but it's the very key to my sustenance, my success, my good health, my parnasa, and everything because of it. And that's why the Kohen Gadol realized that this poor man's two birds took precedence over anyone else's. And were more important than even the thousand burnt offerings of Agripas. And not, unfortunately, not everyone has that same attitude. There are people who do have remorse, even though they may have had a moment, a momentary inspiration, but then they allow things to, to slide and they no longer feel that sense of inspiration that the time that I've, I'm setting aside for this particular mitzvah or for this study uh, time is important. That's why the Torah says, don't switch it. Don't swap it out. Don't give up the time that you've set aside for the, for the, the holy things in your life and exchange them for other things. Don't do it. Because ultimately, once you've dedicated that time for holy endeavors, um, Hashem says, be careful not to squander it. Be careful not to give it up. Because realize, like that poor man did, that the time that you dedicate or the resource that you dedicate to the holy is the very source of your, of your whole sustenance and well-being. And that's really the, the whole theme behind this mitzvah. And perhaps, just perhaps, that might be the reason why we conclude all of the book of Leviticus, which is about Kiddushah, about being holy. We conclude it with this theme, because ultimately the Torah is telling us, it's not for me, says Hashem, but realize that this is for your well-being. The idea of dedication of assets and resources and time and money towards the holy is ultimately for your benefit. And it may be the very key to your, to your prosperity and your success. Yes, Aviv. Yeah, Know older people. Should be an honor. Yeah. Good. Very good. Anyone else? Okay. Yes. Um, I'm sure, like any Greek king, he probably had good days and bad days. You know. Now he's like he's having a level of prophecy if he's seeing in a dream that um, the poor man has offering came before his. Obviously there was something, there was something special or holy about it, King Agrippas, for him, you're right, for him to have had this dream. Yeah. Now, I don't know what his response to it was. 
we don't know the rest of the story, but I, I, I don't remember enough of the history of Agrippas. I know there's a Rehov Agrippas in Jerusalem. That's all I remember. But um, <laughs> but yeah, that's right. It's near Machana Yehuda. So feel free to do your research about King Agrippas and you'll let us know. No, I'm about the class he just had on prophecy and wondering why was he doing that? Yeah, so he must, there, I mean, to donate a thousand burnt offerings to the temple meant that he had a hokara, he had some kind of appreciation for what the temple was all about. Yeah. Okay. Have a good week, everybody. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye.